Very good. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-602-6414 and then press the pound key. Press the pound key again when prompted for participant ID. Once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Okay, uh, again, please press star 9 if you'd like to raise your hand to speak. Uh, caller with the last four numbers, 3784, please uh, press star 6 to unmute yourself and let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers, 3784. Please press star six if you'd like to speak. I'm unmuted, I think. There you go. Thank you. All right. Andrew Gravener, um, all items, I guess. Thank you. All right. So, Paul, you know, I care about animal welfare. Um, you Is there didn't really you'd like to speak to on topic? If not, we'll move on to the next <laughs> caller. No, I'm speaking about the items. I know you don't. I know you consider criticizing you off topic. It is um, off topic. Like, please, please uh, stay <laughs> on topic. The <rest> of <laughs> this Thank is why Kenneth caller. won the controller race. <laughs> caller with the last four numbers four zero zero six. Please state your name and uh, the items you'd like to speak on. Please press star six to unmute yourself. There, I did it twice. It's Renee Rowland from Paw Pack. <laughs> I'm Thank you, Renee. Thank you, you bastard. Hold Thank on for you. one Hi. second, Speakers on the same line. Thank you, Kenneth Mahe. Uh, Ma'am, if you'd like to uh, go on. Yes. Renee Rowland at Paw Pack, and I'm calling with strong support of the amended points that Council Member Koretz just elucidated to end the breeding activity for Billy to relocate him to a suitable sanctuary after his 33 years of hardship at the zoo to improve the conditions at the zoo and to have a report within 60 days on an oversight committee or whatever type of working group uh, that can improve the overall existence for the elephant and just give my heartfelt plea that we get this done uh, after all of these decades and that LA doesn't have this stain on its record of this treatment of intelligent beings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 8685, please uh, state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hi, um, my name is Courtney Fern, and um, I would like to speak on Council Item 1. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Courtney Fern, like I said, I'm the Director of Government Relations and Campaigns for the Non-Human Rights Project, and we'd like to express our strong support for Item 1. For over 30 years, Billy has been held captive at the LA Zoo, and much of his time at the zoo has been spent alone, deprived of the necessary social companionship of other elephants, and confined to small, barren corrals that fail to meet his most basic needs. Elephants are autonomous, social, and cognitively complex beings who suffer greatly when confined to small spaces. Elephants are designed to move, with wild elephants walking over 20 miles a day. Walking to stay well applies to more than just an elephant's physical health. Elephants in small spaces with little mental and physical stimulation often exhibit stereotypic behavior such as rocking and swaying, and Billy has been observed on countless occasions engaging in stereotypic behavior, indicative of stress, and mental anguish. Elephants held captive like Billy suffer from a myriad of ailments that are not observed among their free-living counterparts. Captive elephants suffer from obesity, arthritis, foot problems, and reproductive and psychological, psychological disorders and die at a younger age. And the ultimate source of captive elephant suffering is the overall lack of biologically relevant mental stimulation and physical activity. 
Billy, as well as the other elephants held captive at the LA Zoo, have been forced into a life of subjugation. They have no true freedom of choice. Their days are controlled by zookeepers. They are confined to small corrals that have limited, they have limited access to. And everything about their life at the, LA, that the LA Zoo is forcing them to lead is known to cause enormous suffering in elephants. The LA Zoo has merely kept Billy and the other elephants alive, and nothing about their existence resembles what is necessary to meet their physical and psychological needs. Additionally, the LA Zoo has forced Billy to be a participant in the AZA's grotesque captive breeding program. The captive breeding of elephants in U.S. zoos serves no conservational purpose. The elephants Thank born you, in ma'am. That's two are... minutes. Okay. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, eight, I'm sorry, 6142. Please uh, state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello with the last four number six one. Hello. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, good. My name is Courtney Scott. I'm the elephant consultant for In Defense of Animals. And I wanted to highlight a few facts about Billy. He's been there since he's four years old and he exhibits uh, a lot of deprivation behavior and stereotypical behavior. He is in a very small space and there's a recent study that shows that elephants suffer in particular with small spaces. In fact, it takes one minute for an elephant to walk across a 2.47 acre exhibit. So that kind of tells you how much roaming Billy can do in the zoo. Lack of stimulation and adequate nourishment. Billy, like all the elephants at the zoo, is prevented from browsing on the vegetation surrounding the zoo exhibit with electric fencing. Browsing on foliage is an essential behavior for elephants. Invasive procedures. Zoo records show at least 55 attempts to extract sperm from Billy to no avail. The procedure involves a keeper sticking their arm up Billy's rectum to massage his prostate. Stereotypical behavior. Billy exhi exhibits some of the worst we've seen of any elephant in any zoo. He continuously bobs his head. This is an indication of extreme psychological stress, and we now know from another study that it is an example of brain damage. The LA Zoo has been on in defense of animals 10 more zoos for elephants seven times. Billy's sad story is one of the main reasons. Billy has given the zoo and the city of Los Angeles 33 years of his life. We ask you to give Billy the, free, the gift of freedom. Thank you for your attention to this matter. Thank you, ma'am. Caller with the last four numbers, 8377. Please um, let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yes, please begin. My name is Patty Shanker. First of all, I want to thank Councilmember Paul Koretz for his many years of service to our city and state, and especially for all he has done for the animals here. I strongly support all the motions you have made concerning the elephants at the LA Zoo. I think we should look at Billy as another civil servant. He didn't enlist, he was drafted as a baby by our government to do service, and he did so as painful as it was for him, and for over 33 years. It is now time to let him retire, as we do soldiers and other governmental servants. It is time to let him live a peaceful life with the semblance and space of the wild that he has been denied his entire life. Please send Billy to a sanctuary to live out the rest of his life. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, ma'am. Caller with the last four numbers, 8836. Please let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers, 8836. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Can you hear, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, 
My name is Wendy Marcus Minovitz, and I am a co-admin for Guardians of Los Angeles. Oh, before I finish, I also want to thank Paul Karif for his invaluable service for so many years. Um, I would like to speak on behalf of Billy, a male elephant captured from the wild while still a baby. He was sent to the Los Angeles Zoo where he has been languishing for more than 30 years as a commodity. Anyone who has observed his constant head bobbing or stereotypy can see his mental anguish. This behavior was not seen in elephants in the wild. Billy was deprived of his birthright, which was freedom to live in the wild with his family. It is too late to give that back to him, but it is not too late to allow him the next best thing, which is a sanctuary where he will have room to roam, forage, and importantly, to be away from the city noise, lights, and pollution. At least two sanctuaries are offering a home to Billy. He has served his time and then some. Please do the right thing for him and allow him to live the rest of his life as an elephant who can make free choices and finally experience the happiness that he deserves. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, callers, if you can press star nine to raise your hand, that would be great. Caller with the last four numbers, 0121, please let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Um, hi, my name is, Thank I'm, you. I'm 0121. Thank you. Um, Sharon Brewer, I'd like to speak on um, item one and public comment. Yeah, there is no That's public okay. comment on this. It, this is a special meeting. It's just item one or, or the other oh. items. Okay. Well, I've been holding that. Anyway, I agree with number one, um, note about the, um, the elephant, Billy, I remember lots of um, comments and stuff before at city council meetings about um, the, him needing to, you know, be able to go to a sanctuary and stuff like that. Um, animals just need to be able to go to the sanctuaries when they're um, getting older or they can't have a um, quality of life um, on there. So I'm for that and I'm sorry I can't do public comment, but thank you anyway, bye. Thank you. Caller with the last four numbers, 1403, please state your name and let us know what the items that you'd like to speak on. Go ahead, caller. Yes, all items in general public comment. There is no general public comment, sir. You have two minutes. We well, have wonderful. And this is your last day after the defeat by Kenneth Mejia. What wonderful yeah, is there day. Is you'd like to speak to on the agenda? Otherwise, we'll go on to the next caller. Bye. Bye, you unemployed fat pig. We'll see you later in West Hollywood someday for dinner or lunch. As Next we caller, please. Path. Thank you, Ms. In the, darkness, in the loveliness of the night and Next the daytime. Caller, call with the last four numbers, 7475. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, my name is Diana Munoz. I am founder of Gentle Giants Nonprofit, and I'm calling on behalf of Billy as a person that has taken or seen firsthand uh, how elephants thrive once they are moved to sanctuary. A very famous um, case being Kavan, the elephant that was moved from the Pakistan Zoo to the Cambodia Wildlife Sanctuary who is about Billy's age. We have seen his progress. We have seen how Kavan stopped existing and started living and he is thriving and all of the stereotyping that Billy exhibits now 
Kavan did too, and in Sanctuary has stopped. So I really ask you to please consider, and I urge you to send Billy to Sanctuary. Billy is a highly intelligent sentient being that deserves a lot more than what we could ever give him. We've taken everything for him, from him, and it's time that we right our wrongs. We can't give him back everything uh, we've taken from him, but we can't give him the last years, hopefully many, many years, because elephants live way until, the, uh, just like us, into their 70s, if they are living in the right environment. I have seen many elephants, it's not only Kavan, but many other elephants in physical, terrible conditions move to sanctuary and they have just had a change of attitude, a change of life, a change of physical and emotional uh, environment brings them back to life and this is what we should do for Billy and actually all elephants and all of those. So please um, really look at these other cases and let's do what's right for Billy and for all the other elephants at the zoo. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, caller with the last four numbers, 4024. Please state your name and let us know the items you'd like to speak on. I'd like to speak on non-agenda item. Um, this like to person speak has on already item. spoken. This person's already times. spoken. This is harder than your fat fucking pig. Please. Let me speak, Mr. Pocorin. Next caller. I want to talk about the elephant. Let Billy live. I... Caller with the last four numbers, 4024. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. You fucking fat pig, don't hang up. Caller with the last four numbers, 4270. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers. Hello? Yes. Hello? Yes. Yeah, hi. This is, um, thank, this is Karen Bonadio, and I want to talk about Billy, and I can't thank you. Councilman Paul Koretz enough for everything that he's done for elephants. But instead of my words, I want to speak the words that Ron Kagan spoke, who was the executive director of the Detroit Zoo for 28 years. I have this recording. I can provide it to anyone who would like it. It's on YouTube. This is Ron's words. In 2005, we sent our elephants to a sanctuary in California called Paws. We basically felt that if we were going to keep any animals in captivity, including elephants, that they need to be able to thrive. It is very difficult for elephants in captivity to thrive. There are social problems, physical problems. So we felt it was very important to make sure that they can do well. And the best place for them was to go to a sanctuary. So we sent them to pause, and it was a very good decision and a very happy ending and a great thing for the zoo. Our zoo attendance went up, not down, and we all felt good about where the elephants were as opposed to feel really bad. I just want to say that I concur with what Ron Kagan said then. He continues to speak out. He's done TED Talks. He's also been on 60 Minutes and has discussed how he feels about elephants in captivity and how much better they do when they can go to a sanctuary, they can thrive, make their own decisions. Um, and so I just really appreciate having this opportunity to speak and I've, I've been a supporter of thank, Billy thank you, for over 15 years. Thank you, and thank you so very much. Uh, 
callers, please press star nine if you'd like to speak. Caller with the last four numbers, 9039. Please state your name and let us know the items you'd like to speak on. Please press star six to unmute yourself. Caller with the last four numbers 9039, please press star six to unmute yourself. Okay, we will go on to the next caller. Caller with the last four numbers 6059, please press star six to unmute yourself and let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers 6059, please press star six to unmute yourself. Let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers 6059, please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and let us know what items you'd like to speak on. Okay, going on to the next caller. Caller with the last four numbers five, uh, I'm sorry, 6917. Please let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Hi, I'm Dylan. Uh, I'm calling to urge that uh, the elephant is moved to a sanctuary, which is much more beneficial and humane. Um, I mean, that's all I have. Thank you. Is that it, sir? Yes. Thank you very much. Caller with the last four numbers 6059, please press star six to unmute yourself. Let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers 6059, please unmute yourself. Let us know your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Um, caller with the last four numbers, 4270, please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Caller with the last four numbers, 4270, please press star six to unmute yourself. State your name and the items you'd like to speak on. And then the last caller is Colin user one. Please state your name and the items you'd like to speak on. Yeah, we've got just the uh, elephant uh, exhibit. Uh, and very clear, you know what I'm gonna say about this. It's, it's great that this is happening now, but I am not even remotely appreciative of this. This should have been done years and years and years ago. And just like Paul Perrette did with the circus, by bleeding and bleeding and manipulating the story to keep himself relevant, it is a tragedy that you let it go until your last freaking committee meeting to set this elephant where he should have been all along. We had no right to take him from where he came. And what you've done is you've reinforced for generations of visitors to the zoo, especially children, that it's okay to take an, a wild animal and put him in an urban environment that's not healthy for him. 
this is a this is a bittersweet moment that yeah he's going where he really should be going, but it's tragic that you used him for for political purposes and it speaks volumes of everything that Paul Kretz has represented to use and manipulate animal welfare issues to keep himself relevant at their expense at at, at the suffering for decades and decades and and if you really cared about the whole damn thing you, you should send all of the animals to sanctuary because we have no business keeping any of them captive. Uh, I, I, I would have been your biggest champion if you did these things now, years ago, like you should have. I wish you well in your retirement, Paul, but, but really, this, this is bittersweet. It's tragic, and I'm, I'm not appreciative of it. It should have been done years ago. You don't get thanked for something in 2023 you should have done 10 years ago. It, it, it's just, just disgraceful, and, and that's my final word to you. Be well. Thank you. And we are done with public comment. And just for the record, I have to speak to that last caller. I've worked for 13 and a half years, and even before I got on council to try and free Billy, I have put forward many motions. The only difference with this one, which is much more recent, is that it was referred to my committee. The ones that were referred to other committees um, relating to Griffith Park um, just sat and were never heard by those chairs. Um, so. This is my first actual opportunity, um, and uh, we'll see what happens. But it's not for lack of trying. Uh, I can't do magic. I can't make chairs of other committees hear items that I've put forward. So uh, we now do have this opportunity. Um, now I'd like to ask each of the panelists to uh, make their statements. And uh, I'd like to begin with Cher. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to not cry, and I'm not going to cuss. But I believe that what that man just said is, is so right on. You guys have used him and abused him, and, and he deserves to be free. He deserves to, you know, everyone thinks that elephants that are shaking their head and kind of dancing around are happy, but they're not. You know, I, I think I first went to talk about Billy maybe eight years ago. And, and because I couldn't save him, I went to Cambodia. I went to Islamabad to save Kavan. And it took me four years. And I, I don't understand why you've waited so long to do the right thing. You know, I just, I don't understand it. I, I really, it, it, it's beyond, it's beyond bearing that, you know what you know what the right thing to do is. It's not a so there's no question. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to the rest of the people. So the rest of the councilmen. So it's not. This is not magic. It's not magic. You you must send him. He doesn't have that many more years to his life. You know how would you like it? Would you do that to your dog? Would you keep him locked up, unable to move around? You know with with no love and no caring so that, you know, some rich people could get their way and use their influence and, and keep a beautiful animal, a social animal from living a life. And I thank you for your effort, but the rest of this is just ridiculous. I'm sick of it. And I know that last, no one has listened to us. You know, no one has listened to us going and you know, and and we have experts. That doesn't matter. We are, you know, we are passionate. That doesn't matter. You know, the LA Zoo. I don't know who they've got on their side, but it must be someone giant in politics. Well, thank you, Chair. Uh, the next speaker is Lily Tomlin. Do we know if Lily is there? Hello. Hi, is this Lily? Yeah, hi, Paul. It's Lily. Um, I'm listening to that the, the last caller that called and and then uh, and then Cher. I I was with Cher most of that time when she was on uh, on the 
the group trying to free Billy. Uh, I, I interacted with uh, a lot of the old council people who were just really shameful. Um, I'm not as well acquainted with the new batch of council people, but um, We've known about Billy for so long. There's so many, there were, I, Billy's not the only one, but Billy's the one that we're concerned about today. Um, I agree with Cher, everything she says. I agree with that call in, caller in who chastised everyone. Uh, uh, and I, I've just been sick and miserable because Billy, when I look at Billy and I think of the life they have, the, all the elephants in the zoos and, and in the circuses and every place else that they're held in captivity. It's, uh, it's really too painful to consider because it's a life of a creature that is, we, well, I don't, we, have no, we have no business being the stewards of this earth anyway. We should uh, just be ashamed of what we've accomplished and failed at. De-accomplished, I should say. Anyway, Paul, I love you very much. You've been a wonderful person. You supported everything along the way and tried your darndest. Um, all I can remember is one time I was in the council room and Garcetti was the mayor and everyone had one minute to speak. And I was gonna just say that the elephant enclosure is, is, a, is comparable to a three car garage. And uh, he, cut me, <laughs> he cut me off, you know, and uh, and, and then uh, another time, Labange, Le, Le, what was his name? Labange, he was, and the zoo was in his district. I, they won some vote that we'd had the votes on it. We were sure we were gonna win this one. And uh, they all turned at no time. I could watch them all being uh, talked to and being promised some crap thing. And uh, we lost that vote. It was years ago, I don't recall, but Labange came over and he said, he stuck his hand out to me, he said, we can agree to disagree. And I held on to his hand and I just jerked on him and pulled him and I wouldn't let go. And I, those are the only high points of my life in the, in the zoo business that I can even recall. It was, um, just gave me impetus to go on and, and pursue it further. So the, um, I will say one simple thing uh, zoos and and uh, and sanctuaries. The thing that divides them is philosophy. Zoos exhibit uh, exist to perpetuate the profit and exploitation of, of creatures, and sanctuaries are just there to provide haven and safety and care for the ones who have been cast into captivity and can't go back to their lives in the wild. Anyway, bless you all. And let's hope Billy gets released. Thank you, Lily. Um, next, we'll have uh, Denise Verrett, the director of the zoo, and have her make a statement. Good afternoon, uh, Council Member Peretz and members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee relative to the motion. Um, uh, I listened to your uh, amendments and your changes um, that you read. Um, you know that uh, I am committed to the welfare and the well being of all the animals at the zoo, as it's our number one priority. Uh, the care of the animals uh, is carried out daily by our team of incredibly knowledgeable, talented, and experienced and passionate staff. Uh, we have a comprehensive animal welfare framework program that you referenced. Um, and we are committed to all of the animals at the Los Angeles Zoo. Um, based on the uh, amended uh, instructions that you have presented, um, we support uh, those recommendations uh, from the committee. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Beth Schaefer, our Director of Animal Programs. Yep, uh, Beth and Dominique are, uh, Dr. Dominique Keller, our Chief Veterinarian, are here to answer any questions that you might have. Okay, so they don't want to make additional statements. Okay, um, next speaker is uh, Dorothy Wolpert on our panel. Is, is Dorothy Wolpert around? And 
Yes, I'm yeah, here, but somebody else is speaking. Yeah, but I think you may be uh, well, uh, not muted. The the there we go. All right, good afternoon. Um, I, one thing good afternoon. I want to confirm uh, to my great delight and somewhat amazement before I speak, uh, did Ms. Barrett just say that the zoo is now supporting the transfer of Billy to the sanctuary. I want that to be clear on the record. No, what I'm supporting is the actual recommendation, which is that the zoo be instructed to actively seek opportunities to relocate Billy to a suitable sanctuary. I say, well, that sounds like the double talk that we've been hearing from the zoo for at least 10 years, in my knowledge. The speakers that, that you've heard from have been trying to rescue Billy from a life of suffering and abuse for over 10 years. Uh, in 2012, they brought a lawsuit against the LA Zoo and its director aiming at stopping the inhumane treatment that Billy was being subjected to, treatment that was destroying his health and well-being. That case was tried in June of 2012 20 years ago, more than uh, 10 years ago. The evidence presented in that trial established that the physical and emotional degradation of the elephants at the zoo is so pronounced that members of the public whose taxpayer, taxpayer dollars fund the zoo regularly would ask, what's so wrong with the elephants at our zoo? The judge in that case found that all is not well at the Elephants of Asia exhibit at the Los Angeles Zoo. Contrary to what the zoo's representative may have told the LA City Council, and this is a quote from the judge, in order to get construction of the $42 million exhibit appro approved and funded, the elements, elephants are not happy, they are not healthy, and they are not thriving. The judge found that the ground of the exhibit on which the elephants regularly walked and swayed back and forth in an in a activity that all experts in elephant behavior acknowledge is a sign of distress and emotional pain, was hard, not varied or soft, and created a risk of injury to the elephant's joints, feet, and nails. The judge in that case, in a 30-page opinion, excoriated the zookeepers and the zoo executives. He said, the false testimony of the elephant keepers made him wonder whether the keepers and the medical staff were working at the same zoo. He gave us an example, and I, I find this so moving and upsetting, but he said, elephants enjoy rubbing against and playing with trees and like to knock them over and eat them. That's what they do in the wild. The trees and planters in the exhibit at the zoo are surrounded by electrical wires that prevent the elephants from getting to them or walking near them. The photographic evidence confirmed that testimony in that trial. The, the judge further found that the ramps that lead in and out of the pool that elephants we all know love to bathe and spray water on their head with their trunks were lined with electric wires. He said that life of the elephants in the Los Angeles Zoo is even worse. It is undisputed that elephants by nature are attracted to and have evolved to need and use trees, bushes, and grass. He found, found that rather than providing the elephants with trees to rub against and knock down as part of an enriched environment that stimulates and elicits species-specific behavior, the zoo elephant management system tempts the elephant, it's almost sadistic, with trees that elephants naturally use to rub against and knock down, but frustrates them by keeping those trees in visual and sensory range, but beyond access. 
the elephant exhibit in the zoo, the judge said, was not a happy place for elephants, nor is it for members of the public who go to the zoo and recognize that the elephants are neither thriving, happy, nor content. He noted poignantly, he said, captivity is a terrible existence for any intelligent, self-aware species, which the undisputed evidence shows elephants are. To believe otherwise, as some high-ranking zoo employees appear to believe, is delusional, and the quality of life that Billy has endured in their captivity is particularly poor. The court in 2012, 10 years ago, ordered the zoo to make changes to improve the conditions of the elephants, and the zoo ignored the court orders. Instead, spent thousands of taxpayer dollars fighting those orders all the way to the California Supreme Court. And so, while those endless frivolous appeals wended their way through the courts, once again, Voice for the Animals tried to rescue Billy. In October 2015, they retained my law firm to make a Public Records Act request of the zoo to obtain information about Billy's health and treatment in the intervening years and to learn if the zoo had complied with the court orders. We sent the zoo a request outlining with great specificity the information they were seeking, we were seeking. The Public Records Act is a mechanism for the public to obtain information about how government is carrying out its obligations. It it's enshrined in our Constitution because as the Supreme Court said, openness in government is essential to the functioning of a democracy, and such access permits checks against the arbitrary exercise of official power and secrecy in the political process. Secrecy in government, as we know, is corrosive. It deprives citizens of the information they need to participate in our democratic system and to evaluate the performance of public officials. Willful withholding and intentional delay are evidence that the target agency has something to hide. In our case, the zoo spent two years of delay and deception in its effort to hide the truth about Billy. In the face of sub a, such obstructionism, we concluded that the only way to get the information was to bring another lawsuit and we filed against the zoo in 2017. That case went to trial in April 2019. The court found that the court, the zoo, had failed to perform its legal duty under the California Public Records Act by improperly holding, withholding documents. The withholding of information about how the zoo was caring for Billy was an unseemly ploy by a public agency to hide from the public its egregious betrayal of its mission. And the zoo ordered the documents produced. But Billy still suffers in his brutal captivity and still is subject to relentless abuse and neglect of his fundamental needs. As we've heard from one other speaker, it's widely acknowledged today that urban zoos are no place for elephants. Zoos across the world, like Detroit, have released their caged elephants to sanctuary. Even Ringling Brothers finally admitted its decades of elephant torture and released those still in captivity. The sanctuary Billy has been offered waits to take him and heal him. Time has certainly come for this council to ameliorate Billy's abuse and at least in part, make up for the years of neglect and indifference inflicted upon him by the zoo, by letting him spend his last years in comfort. It is very disconcerting to hear from the current director of the zoo that all they're gonna do is look into it. They've been looking into it for 10 years Please do not pass an amendment that does nothing more than allow them to continue that obstruction and indifference. They should be ordered forthwith to send Billy to a sanctuary 
that is ready to receive him, ready to heal him, and ready to do the right thing. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, speaker on our panel is Morgan Schwartz. Hi, thank you for having me, and I appreciate the effort that you're putting into this. Um, I'm a, an LA native myself. I <clears throat> grew up in Los Angeles, attended public schools, um, attended the, visited the school as a child, um, and later um, as a teacher, where I, I spent 35 years of my career teaching students in Los Angeles and as an administrator. And I've seen children at the zoo, uh, both, both when I was a child and as a chaperone. And it's important to talk about the educational value of seeing elephants in the zoo as I have on both ends. And it's pretty thin. And you know, when you take little children with their parents, when they go to the zoo, they're just being taken around. They see them, they see the animals, and that's about it. Then when you get into upper elementary and middle school, those outings are entirely social events for the children. They are not learning anything. They may fill out a worksheet, but they're not really learning anything on their own, excuse me, anything on their own. High school kids are entirely different matter. They see the cruelty and the inhumanity of these animals because they know about the animal. They know they are uh, long lived. They are the largest land animal on earth and they're extremely social and have a complex society. And they see that these animals have none of the benefits of being in their natural environment. So the absurd situation of taking one of the most complicated animals on earth and isolating it in a small confinement is not lost on anyone from say middle school through uh, adulthood. And in fact, from an educational point of view, it's, it's malpractice. No educator would set up a false lesson to teach something. And I don't know what they're teaching. You know, you could say, are they large? Yes, they're large. You could say you could substitute a, a model, a sculpture of an animal and teach the same thing. But today, with current technology like we're using right now, you could have wild wildlife cameras live or recorded all over the environment and directly observe herd behavior where they're solving problems, they're raising families, they're navigating their environment, and they're playing and reproducing in a, in a proper environment. They live longer in the wild than they do in captivity. That's a strange lesson to be teaching children. Why is that? It's because they suffer in captivity. They have no joy, no play, and these are lessons that are learned. And if the zoo or you and your committee are, have, have the ability to, the lesson that the public will learn and the children is that they have the courage to adjust their thinking with new information. And that lesson is about teaching ethics, um, and to end cruelty and inhumane behavior toward this sentient animal that we have just heard a lot about. Um, and I really, again, appreciate the effort to look into this um, and to echo the timeline. I started writing letters to this council in 2006 about this very effort. So I do think it's time to give Billy his due and send him to pause or any other sanctuary and end captive uh, elephant uh, situations in Los Angeles. If you have the ability to do so, why not do so? There's no educational value whatsoever in having them in captivity. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. And uh, next uh, panelist is Dr. Phil Ensley. Dr. Ensley, are you with us? I see Dr. Ensley's uh, name on the board, but I don't know if he's hearing this. Uh, if not, we could go on to the next panelist and hear him laugh. Um, let's hear from David Castleman. Thank you, Councilman. 
This is, um, like others, bittersweet in that it's been so long, but better late than never for cer certain. And I appreciate the efforts uh, Council Member Kretz has made over all the years that he's been working on these issues. Uh, again, I, I acknowledge it. you can't control everybody else. You can only do what you can do. And that was true for me too. I spent eight years, $7 million of my time litigating the case that Ms. Wolpert was quoting from. Can't hear you. Can't and see I think you hear me. Dr. Helmsley, we've moved on to the next panelist. You can we'll, go if he's ready. We'll, we'll hear from you uh, uh, afterwards, unless uh, David, you'd like to let. That's him. fine. He can go. Okay, Dr. Hensley, why don't you go next? Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you see me? No. Well, I'll speak then. I, I can see myself on my screen, but I, I don't see myself on your screen. But I'll 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 speak if I'll just go ahead and speak if that's okay. Yeah. It, did you click on your video? Uh, let's see. Yeah. I got video clicked on. Yes. Okay. Well, I guess it's not working. So let's let's hear from uh, me. That's the main thing. Okay. Well, uh, good afternoon. My name is Phil Ensley, and uh, I'm a diplomat of the American College of Zoological Medicine. Uh, I did my postdoctoral training at the Smithsonian Institution of uh, the National Zoo. Uh, prior to retirement, I worked at San Diego Zoo and Safari Park for 29 years as a veterinarian. Actually, I'm no stranger to this committee. I, I testified here about bull hooks uh, in 2012. So I'm uh, uh, familiar with uh, uh, your committee. On, on two occasions, I was actually selected by the Los Angeles Department of Animal Services to inspect Ringling Brothers Circus in 2012 and 2014 and submit written reports of my findings. Uh, and uh, now I've uh, done two reports on Billy so uh, and submitted findings. So, But I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to your city council discussion about the future of Billy. I was contacted to review uh, Billy's uh, medical and husbandry records numbering really over 42,000 pages. And I was also called upon to evaluate the training video that was uh, actually documenting uh, Billy's training, which was really severe abuse of Billy uh, when he was just four years old. And it's reasonable to assume this abuse continued for years. Uh, I was requested to, replete, to, to complete actually three tasks. One, provide a, uh, a written assessment of Billy's health and welfare. Two, to learn uh, if there should be a recommendation for relocation to a California sanctuary. And three, conduct a site visit to the PAWS sanctuary in San Andreas. And my opinions appear in a uh, report dated February 2020. And uh, I was asked to complete a, uh, a follow-up report and provide a report and uh, opinion. And th my, re my report, you know, indicates my recommendation, and that is that the LA Zoo must relocate Billy to pause as a commitment to a recuperate level of, of long-term care, and as well now consider the same for the three females there, Tina, Jewel, and Shawnzy. Uh, the conclusion in my reports was that there is harm being caused to Billy, and it's of long duration, and, uh, and now harm to the three Asian females is evident as well and appears to be a uh, mission-driven disorder by the LA Zoo requiring resolution. Uh, fact, uh, concerning the issue of stereotypic behavior, this behavior is now well documented and recognized by the relevant scientific community as an indicator of compromised welfare. Uh, in my experience, stereotypic behavior manifests as repetitive, meaningless activity induced by frustration from experiencing inadequate social and mental stimulation. And it's really an attempt just to cope with suffering from unpleasant states such as fear, pain, and distress. Uh, fact, uh, stereotypic behavior in captive elephants is closely linked really to the amount of and quality of space in which they have access. Uh, in my report, I noted consulting engineers and geologists testing the ground surfaces of the elephants LA Zoo exhibit. It reveals hardness and exhibit substrate being you know, equal to that of asphalt or concrete. Elephants, as another gentleman mentioned, are the largest uh, terrestrial mammals 
with, but, but, the, but of interest, they have little angulation in their limbs. And this is just simply how elephant limbs and feet have evolved. And the fact is, the physics involved is that abnormal biomechanical forces on normal limb articulations against abnormal uh, or unnatural surfaces leads to irreversible progressive degenerative joint disease. Uh, fact, uh, you know, in my second report, it contains the findings of two board certified veterinary radiologists who interpret elephant foot and leg x rays. These these radiologists teach at the University of Missouri and the Ohio State University Schools of Veterinary Medicine, both found present in LA Zoo elephant x-ray studies, documented findings of arthritis, uh, foot abscesses, infection, degenerative joint disease, and osteomyelitis. All of these findings uh, of interest, you know, have been historically present in LA Zoo's elephants and currently present in the four elephants at the LA Zoo. Uh, of interest, you, you may not know this, but in, in 2016, I provided a uh, health and welfare assessment of three Asian female elephants at the San Antonio Zoo. And uh, it's a nearly identical case with the, 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 what's happening at the LA Zoo. Of interest, two of those three elephants are now dead, and the San Antonio Zoo is looking to rehome their third uh, elephant there. So uh, I want to thank you for your attention. If you want me to repeat my recommendation and conclusion, I'll be more than happy to do so. I'm sorry I'm not coming through visually on your screen. Well, thank you, Dr. Ensley. We appreciate it. Um, and if, if uh, everyone could stick around for, for questions, all of our experts. Um, uh, Mr. Castleman, you're our last uh, panelist. Thank you. <clears throat> so as I started to say, um, I was the lawyer that filed the case, took it through the Supreme Court. Uh, Mr. Ensley, I'm pleased to say, was one of our experts at that trial. As he noted, he went through years of records that we had to obtain by court order. The zoo didn't comply with literally any uh, objective request. And unfortunately, the case was defended by the city attorney's office, which in my view, is a conflict of interest because they're charged with prosecuting people who violate the animal cruelty laws. And instead of doing that, they defended the zoo in this case, which the court ultimately found what did in fact violate elephant cruelty or animal cruelty laws. But I think the importance of what we're talking about here uh, goes beyond some of the portions of the opinion that were read by Ms. Wolpert. The zoo has for yeah. many years um, tried to hide the facts. Uh, one of the things Mr. Ensley talked about was the uh, examination, if you will, and study of how Billy was trained in the zoo. We had video that the zoo refused to allow in because they said we couldn't authenticate it. The minute we produced the witness to authenticate it, they stipulated to it. And it showed Billy being dramatically forced into lying down, spreading his legs, things that they do every day when the children come to the zoo, he's still being forced through those behaviors. And the findings of the court, and I'll read some of the additional ones, the evidence supports plaintiff's claims, which the court finds plaintiff has proven by a preponderance of the evidence that the ground of the elephants of Asia exhibit on which the elephants regularly walk is hard, not varied and soft, and that the substrate of the exhibit creates a risk of injury to the elephant's joints, feet, and nails. And then he goes on to say, consistent with the photographic evidence, which shows that the ground is awfully hard, indeed on some portions of the ground of the exhibit, the elephants who weigh up to six tons do not even leave footprints. And on this basis, he ordered that the exhibit be rototilled, despite the testimony of the zoo's vet, Dr. Eng, who said, well, I was told by the trainers and the people working with the elephants that the exhibits regularly rototilled, which upon cross-examination, it turned out was not true. The exhibit had never been rototilled. And so the history of the elephants and uh, LA Zoo and the truth has been a tortured one at best. And uh, the court made a series of uh, very critical findings, including that the uh, must 
that Billy suffers is a bull elephant because he's in a small space. I'll read the, the finding of the court. Dr. Poole testified that Billy also suffers. Dr. Poole, by the way, is Joyce Poole, probably the foremost wild elephant expert uh, in Africa, and she has uh, expertise in zoo elephants as well. And she testified that Billy also suffers because his heightened and extended must periods of sexual arousal have no outlet and because he does not have enough space to deal with his frustration. It is undisputed that Billy's must period is abnormally long. The zookeepers, of course, denied it and argued to the contrary, and the court said the zookeeper's knowledge, again, pales in comparison. The court again credits Dr. Poole's testimony. And then talking about feet and joint and legs, the zoo called an expert from San Diego Zoo, which Dr. Ensley knows well. His name was Oosterhuis. He's the head vet for San Diego Zoo. And he was called by the zoo as their expert. But the reality of the situation was on cross-examination, which is not something that's available in front of the city council, and under oath, Dr. Oosterhuis was forced to admit a great deal that was harmful. And what the court said regarding his testimony, I'll just read a portion of it. Perhaps most significantly, the testimony of Dr. Oosterhuis, again, a witness called by defendants, was not much different than an outline of plaintiff's claims in this case. And perhaps as much as the testimony of any witness called by the plaintiffs supports plaintiff's claims. Dr. Oosterhuis testified that the stereotypic behavior exhibited by all three of the elephants at the Los Angeles Zoo of head bobbing, rocking and swaying places too much pressure on the elephant's feet and causes cracks in the nails. And then he went on to say, no matter how good a foot program is, the elephant is eventually in captivity, will eventually develop foot problems as a result. And the consequences catch up with an older elephant, lack of exercise is important, and the court says this is the basis of most of plaintiff's claims in this action. The bottom line, Dr. Oosterhuis admitted that if you have elephants in captivity, it's just a matter of time that they develop abscesses, foot and leg problems, and they die from those ailments. Billy is well along in that process, and they know that. And they could test all the elephants by giving them tests that have been available known to vets routinely with cortisol. They check the cortisol in their blood. On cross-examination, Dr. Eng admitted they'd never once tested the zoo elephants, even though he knew that this was a fact. You can test them with cortisol and find out the levels of their uh, anxiety. So what's happened has been progressive, it was predictable, and it'll continue until Billy and the other elephants die. And in addition to having had a history as a trial lawyer, I am the founder uh, of the Cambodia Wildlife Sanctuary. I spent five years, chair of course was part of, and a very significant part of the team that convinced the Pakistan court and ultimately assisted in flying Billy from Islamabad to the Cambodia Wildlife Sanctuary in Siri, where ultimately he was released into his own self-created, not self-created, created by us, jungle sanctuary. He now has many, many acres to himself. He has his own giant swimming pool. And we have offered before, and I'll offer again, to fly Billy from Los Angeles to Cambodia and create a pen parallel to Billy's of comparable size so he can live in a jungle sanctuary that really can't be duplicated anywhere here in California. Although I fully concede that Paws is a wonderful sanctuary, and if he could be admitted there and the cost is not exorbitant to the city or whoever has to pay it, that would be fine to help Billy. Same with the Tennessee Elephant Sanctuary. They're a wonderful sanctuary, and if that is a financial opportunity that the city's willing to take up, that's fine. The difference with Cambodia, aside from it being in Asia, we will take Billy, we have assistance to help us fly him. I'm partners with Lech Chyler and Derek Thompson, her husband, probably the foremost experts in the world on transporting elephants. They've seen Billy, they've assured me he can be safely transported. 
probably using the same plane we used for Kavan because it's perfect for that. And we will care for him at no charge for the rest of his life in a sanctuary environment that we create. I think there is no other outcome for Billy that's better than a sanctuary, regardless of which one among the three. All I care about is to see him freed and safe and have a wonderful life to the extent possible. And I, my last comment was, prior to Kavan coming to Cambodia, every scientist questioned on the subject expressed doubt that an elephant once subjected to the kind of cruelty that is involved in keeping an elephant in small spaces, inevitably on hard ground because they could walk around the exhibit so fast and they pad down the space that's just constantly being hardened, uh, they will never recover from their stereotypic abu you know, psychological trauma. Kavan had every single incident that happened to him that Billy has had. He had horrible stereotypic behavior and within one month released into the sanctuary in Cambodia, those behaviors almost disappeared and now a year later, uh, it's gone. He is enjoying himself and the same can happen to Billy. We just need the support of the council to do the right thing. And to the extent that the zoo would like more information or I can help in any way to facilitate his transfer to a sanctuary, any of those sanctuaries, please call on me, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, now we'd like to show a short video if we can queue it up. Okay, give me a second, please. Billy the elephant has been at the LA Zoo for 33 years. He lives in constant pain and anguish. The LA Zoo claims that they're taking good care of Billy and the other elephants. But the truth reveals a very dark and different reality. For four years, we sent legal requests for Billy's records, but the zoo refused to respond. The records reveal a long history of neglect and cruelty. We gave the records to Dr. Enzo, an expert on elephants in captivity. Here is what he found that the zoo had kept hidden. Billy does this all day, nonstop, head bobbing, swaying. It's called stereotypic behavior. It's the result of years of mental and physical suffering. Wild elephants never behave this way nor do the elephants at cause, a sanctuary in Northern California that's willing to give Billy a home. Stereotypic behavior leads directly to Billy's life-threatening foot problems. His repetitive behavior and constant pacing cracks his nails, and feeding stations often collect feces and urine, which can easily infect Billy's cracked nails, causing a dangerous condition called osteomyelitis. Also, the rock-solid floor of Billy's enclosure causes other devastating health problems. According to a study at the LA Zoo, his enclosure has a hardness comparable to asphalt or concrete. Unnaturally hard surfaces like these lead to irreversible joint disease. Many other LA Zoo elephants have suffered from this. Over nearly four decades, 16 elephants have died. They all suffered from foot and joint disease. And when Billy was just a calf, to prepare him for a lifetime in captivity, he was forced to endure a brutal training regime, which still affects his mental well-being. Billy came to the LA Zoo in 1989. He was only about four years old. This is a training video made at the zoo with Billy as an example of how to train an elephant. Billy's tusks have been cut, his front legs chained, and the bull hook held by the trainer. For Billy to have reached the level of cooperation demonstrated in the LA Zoo training video, he would have had to suffer through days of repetitive physical pain and calculated discipline and beatings. Procedures, that's the people we had in the barn, sadists. He would chain the elephants, 
uh, but all four feet and not back with the back of the Billy's history of abuse is irrefutable, but a new, caring future is within easy reach. Claus has 15 acres of hills, fields, and streams waiting for Billy. I believe a well-run sanctuary with proper veterinary support is a much better environment for an elephant. It allows an elephant to really be an elephant. No matter how well-run a zoo might be, it's inevitably not as natural or healthy an environment for these animals. And that is why I've been working to free Billy for more than a decade. Dr. Ensley recommends that the Los Angeles Zoo relocate Billy to Claus as a commitment to his long-term care and rehabilitation. Billy doesn't have much time left. Please let him spend his remaining years at Claus. LA City Council, it's time for you to do the right thing and send Billy to pause now. So, uh, I have some questions for the panel, and if uh, my colleagues want to join in and, and ask questions, uh, you know, please raise your virtual hand at any time or just jump in. Um, first, for Dr. Ensley. Uh, the underpinning of the zoo's argument for keeping Billy uh, has historically rested on the ability to provide him better care than a sanctuary. My perception is that at a sanctuary, he wouldn't need such intensive care if he were leading a more natural lifestyle. Elephant advocates have raised serious questions about the actual level of care any zoo is willing and able to provide. Is that a fair characterization? And if so, why do you think that? Dr. Ensley, you're muted. You are still muted. There you am, go. I, am I okay now? Well, we hear you well now. Okay. And I can see myself in a little square up there on the upper left-hand corner. Uh, no, uh, but I've been to two of the sanctuaries in the United States. Uh, Tennessee Elephant Sanctuary, as well as PAWS, and both have adequate uh, veterinary care. The critical difference, the critical difference between uh, a small space that, uh, that Billy has now and well-trodden grounds as uh, uh, Mr. Castleman and, uh, and Cher and, 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 and Lily have all indicated, the problem is that these are geriatric elephants now. And recent studies have shown that geriatric elephants approaching 40 years of age, they already have uh, irreversible damage to their joints. And what you need to do now is delete the progression of that damage. And the space offered at sanctuaries, and I have seen the substrate, it's like walking, and I'm not exaggerating, on a golf course, which provides softness for their feet, gives them the, 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 the ability to choose where they go, and this provides relief for them and allows their limb joints to stabilize, their tendons and muscles in their limbs to improve, and um, so... There, you cannot compare the two environments. And I don't know if anyone from zoo staff wants to respond to that. I think my response, Council Member Koretz, is that um, they are two different environments, but that does not mean that Billy's welfare cannot be thriving in a zoo environment. I'm not saying that he would not thrive in a sanctuary environment, but we are really just going to respectfully disagree on the welfare that Billy is experiencing at the Los Angeles Zoo. Thank you. Member, if I can. I'd yes, like to, please. You know, one of the major differences uh, between zoo environments and sanctuary environments is whether or not the elephant thinks that their life is satisfactory. And zoos uf uniformly believe that they can provide an adequate life for elephants in zoos. And elephants uniformly respond with stereotypic behavior, which is 
directly responsive to an abusive environment on many levels. The court case details many of them. There's not enough time to read them all. But the bottom line is when an elephant is moved into an environment that no longer creates these kinds of negative impressions, reactions, physical pain and suffering, and psychological deprivation, they stop stereotyping. And that's the difference between the elephants at a good sanctuary and virtually every zoo in the world. Thank you. Question for the general manager. The lower court in Leder versus Lewis litigation from a few years back that was mentioned made several finding of fact. And the judge imposed a set of conditions the zoo was supposed to comply with, including regular tilling of the surface of the exhibit. Now, the case ultimately was overturned by the state Supreme Court on procedural grounds. So the conditions are not officially in effect. Is the zoo still complying with them? And to what degree do they do daily roto tilling? So I appreciate the question. We are complying with all of those that were referenced in the case in terms of roto tilling, roto tilling, exercising, and oh my gosh, the third one is not having a bull hook, which we have not had in over a decade. We are doing that. We even acquired a bobcat through the city budget process that is specifically dedicated for the elephants of Asia exhibit so that it's dedicated to that activity. So we are exercising and we are roto tilling as that as a lower court suggested that we should do. And we have been. And Dorothy, do you have a response to that or something? I do. I do merely in terms of what we learned. I know that Ms. Barrett is new to her post and was not involved in our lawsuit and perhaps not as involved in the history of the elephant exhibit. The truth is that even their own records, which we had to go to court to get, clearly established that the roto tilling was not done. It was supposed to be done on a two week schedule at one point, but there are actual records of when this was done that the caretakers kept. And it just wasn't. It just wasn't. It's that simple. And unhappily, they made many representations to the court, both in Mr. Castleman's case and in our case, that turned out to be false, demonstrably false. And I don't, you know, assign blame for that. If it's a lack of efficiency, competence or awareness, but it's just not true. And there's no monitoring of the keepers who are perhaps it is the policy of the court of the zoo to do these things, but they're not being done. And the most eloquent proof of that is Billy's condition. That his feet have gotten worse over time. His nails have gotten worse over time. And you can see it if you go to the zoo. It looks like concrete. And so I don't know why they continue to make this assertion. It seems it sort of beggars the imagination. If indeed the zoo has any interest in complying with its mission of caring for animals, it cannot go on making these false comments about how they're not doing that. With all due respect, we are not making false comments. I do not make false comments. Maybe the records that you have may represent that, but under my leadership, that is not the case. Well, that's why I said, Ms. Barrett, you're brand new and I appreciate that. May I make a comment for the director, Ms. Verrett? If you read my two reports. I have not seen your reports, Dr. Inslee. That's the other thing. So you're referencing a report that I've never seen and did not even know existed. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, the important thing is after reviewing all of the keeper notes that were handwritten as well as well documented, by the way, the comments on the keepers in one space, which I quote in my report, is that after tilling, the elephants avoid the tilled areas. And the reason for that is because of the unevenness of the grooves that tilling makes. 
And, and the reason they're uncomfortable on that is because they already have arthritis and degenerative joint disease. This has been well documented in their radiographs. And I respect your need to defend your institution. I was the same way working in zoos for over 30 years. That is um, a reflex on your part, and I respect that. But that it, it boils down to, I hate to say it like this, uh, uh, because of respect for your need to defend your institution, but it's siege mentality. Let's get above that and do what is right for these elephants. That should be your primary purpose right now. Your primary purpose right now is the welfare of the animals. I would encourage you to contact um, a Voice for Animals and get copies of my reports, which quote and and uh, the, 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 your keepers' records themselves. Dr. Ansley, I, I have a question for you. So are, are you saying that they do a bad job of rototilling or are you saying that the elephant's feet are so damaged already that even the rototilling doesn't help the problem? Because it's a, it's a combination, it's a combination. If you look at the exhibits, it doesn't take uh, any, um, a layman can, can look at and look at the ground and, and see the hardness and the compactness. And if you look at the geotechnical uh, reports of the engineers and geologists that analyzed the surfaces, there is a mechanical process there defined by science whereby when the sand itself is wetted and becomes moist, it compacts. It's almost like analogous to you going to the beach and as you leave the boardwalk, you're on the soft sand, but as you approach where the um, water comes in and out, it compacts and it's as hard as walking on a sidewalk. And that's what these animals have been doing their entire lives. Uh, all of them, except for Billy, were former circus elephants. The three females were former circus elephants. I've been to too many zoos, read too many necropsy reports to know that this is a slow cumulative process because of the biomechanics of the legs of elephants and the way they have evolved over a millennia. Paul. Uh, David, go ahead. Yeah, I, I don't mean to cast any aspersions, uh, Ms. Barrett, and I believe that you are being told what you're reporting. But I can tell you that a film was made less than in, like, about a year and about a year ago in which the exhibit was filmed and documented. And there was multiple, there were multiple days of filming and, and things like that. And there were, there was no evidence that it was ever rototilled. And I would point out to your defense, in part, from the court's opinion, the court said, and I'm quoting, the Los Angeles Zoo has a history of elephant abuse and of missing zoo records and an absence of documentation of the abuses that the Los Angeles Zoo concedes occurred in the admittedly distant past. The Los Angeles Zoo's history of not keeping complete and accurate records also calls into question the defendant's ability to keep their word. This is the court, and this is before you arrived. And I have no reason to believe that the people inside who were trying to keep their jobs and want to work with elephants and consider it a blessing want to keep doing it. But the reality of it is the, the elephants are really suffering from it. And I don't think there's much you could do even if you were road tilling daily. As Dr. Inslee points out, it's now well past the time where their suffering could be reversed by merely rototilling. And uh, another question to zoo staff. Do you agree with the finding of the AZA's 2017 elephant population analysis, which says even with drastic changes in management, the already shrinking North American elephant population in captivity is likely to continue to decline? Is there any reason we would think otherwise? Is that question, in, go ahead, is that question to who? That's the question to zoo staff. I see. 
I am not in a position to speak on the population sustainability of elephants, so I cannot say yes or no whether that's accurate. Uh, anyone else care to comment on that? There's only one observation I would make, and that is that uh, in the past decades that we know about, uh, Asian elephants have not produced live young that have survived. Uh, it is just simply not an appropriate environment. And often elephants that do produce live young, the mothers kill the babies, probably to save them the suffering that they've been through. And I, I, I would just say to uh, Director Verrett, um, please, I would encourage you to meet, read my reports. Um, I've been looking at elephants now for 50 years, and I can tell you with, with, without any doubt whatsoever that my experience has been that veterinarians, USDA uh, inspectors, are simply not educated. And if you look at the training manuals that they are given to uh, learn how to inspect elephants at zoos, there is no discussion whatsoever on how to identify and interpret uh, lameness in elephants, arthritis in elephants. There is absolutely no discussion on degenerative joint disease in elephants. And if you look at your own USDA inspection reports, they, the USDA inspectors who certify your zoo as being okay and pass, you know, the test, they have never looked at once your elephant's medical and husbandry records, and yet they comment that everything is fine and you'll, you'll get your certification, but it, it is false. I have sat opposite the table of the director of the USDA APHIS inspection and uh, department, and they know absolutely nothing about elephants. And it's, a, and it's a real tragedy, too, because I know and respect what you need to do or want to do, but that doesn't change the picture of what these elephants have to go through. The dem demographics of the elephant population in North America continues to decline year after year after year. And it's for a reason. They are growing old. There is a study that was done and published in the uh, Journal of Zoo and Wildlife Medicine just in the year 2020 by Green, G-R-E-E-N-E at -E Al, and she has evaluated the records of over 300 elephants now. And so she has broken down the demographics such that elephants over 40 now are considered geriatric. I think uh, Billy now is 37 or 38. And he has at least a chance to experience health. But right now, every step he takes is with pain. Every step he takes. And the three females are exactly the same. Every step they uh, take is like, with pain. I think I'd like to get back to the, the question at hand uh, to Ms. Verrett, which is, is really about the breeding program and the fact that, that the numbers are declining. And it seems to be because uh, there's no success at, at captive breeding. And uh, I know the zoo has been unable to obtain cooperation from Billy. Um, it's, uh, I guess it's, it's relatively obvious that an uncomfortable process is something that uh, an elephant doesn't necessarily want to cooperate with. Um, they, it doesn't seem like there's been success in collecting semen despite uh, many uncomfortable efforts. So uh, if, if it's virtually impossible, why are we still doing it? It's clearly not a pleasant process for him. Well, we're not still doing it, uh, Council Member Koretz, and there's been no attempt um, to collect a genetic material from Billy in nearly 10 years, and there are no plans to do so in the immediate future. So, so you don't object to uh, an item ruling that out for the future? Um, I, I do object that it would be codified as policy because it 
gets um, into making animal management decisions that should rest uh, in the hands of the zoo uh, and the professionals um, that are in the position to best make those decisions. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm not impressed in this particular arena with uh, the past decisions, although obviously not engaging in it for a lengthy period of time, uh, I think is wise. I mean, if there was a, a rare elephant born, uh, it would just perpetuate elephants in a zoo anyway, which isn't great, um, but it's, it seems highly unlikely. Uh, so uh, I, I certainly would encourage us to move forward with that item. Um, again, for the zoo staff, in non-pandemic times, there was a daily elephant performance during which elephants had to do some modest tricks uh, not dissimilar from a circus. Uh, how are elephants trained to uh, to do these performances, and what implements are used to obtain their cooperation? So I'll I'll just start off, and then I'll hand it over to Beth. Um, our elephants have never done performances, um, and uh, what you're referring to might be demonstrations that are educational. Um, uh, and I will let Beth uh, answer the rest of that question. Hello, Council Member. Thank you for that question. Um, so all of the training that is currently done at the LA Zoo and has been for many, many years now is all with positive reinforcement. Um, the video that you showed was obviously happened in the past. Uh, I don't think anybody's disputing that. It's not any technique that is um, used anymore. Uh, really in any AZA zoo, um, it's all with cooperation from the animals and the demonstrations um, basically are to show people how we work with the elephants on a day-to-day -day basis, what their daily husbandry is like, and some of the exercises are, of the uh, behaviors are for exercise. Paul. Okay. Go ahead, David. Uh, this is exactly what was claimed by the zoo at trial, and I'll read you the court's finding on this issue. And, and Ms. Vera and Ms. Schaefer, if you haven't seen the court's opinion, the city attorney, I don't think he's even shared it with the council. But I it have it, which has always been shocking to me that yeah. neither the department nor the city attorney has ever made the council, other than myself, since I've long been aware of it, uh, a legal of this case. So directly on this point, let me read you what the court said. As another example, the keepers at the Los Angeles Zoo have Billy lie down, have him stand up on his back two legs in front of spectators at viewpoints at the exhibit. Ms. Garnett, who was then the head elephant keeper, however, does not consider these activities in quote, tricks. Sound familiar? She testified that making Billy stand up in his back two legs is not a trick or performance for the audience, although she does refer to the area where public visitors can hear her as a stage but an exercise to develop his muscles in the event for which there is no plan to have occur, that he has the opportunity to mate with a female elephant. Frankly, this is absurd and the court discredits this testimony. Moreover, Ms. Gornett claims that she does not know how Billy was trained to lie down as the keepers have him do for visitors to the Elephants of Asia exhibit. The court discredits this testimony as well. It is inconceivable that the senior elephant keeper of the Los Angeles Zoo has no knowledge of the kinds of things that elephant trainers had to do to Billy and other elephants to train them to lie down on command, such as using a block and tackle to pull the elephant's legs and poking the elephant's admittedly sensitive skin with a pole and nail, as shown by the film that I referred to you briefly saw a moment ago. For someone who claims to love elephants, it is shocking that she would command or at least assist them in performing an activity that the elephants were taught to do in this way. The court also discredits Ms. Gornett's similarly remarkable testimony that the keepers never command Billy to stand on his back, two legs, or lie down. They merely, in quotes, ask him to do so. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, the general manager again. The AZA program that includes breeding and captivity is the species survival plan, which the zoo is not required to participate in. Would you say the survival plan is about conservation and replenishing 
the overall population of a species or simply replenishing the population in zoos? Is there any chance that a, an elephant born in a zoo uh, winds up going back to the wild? Um, so no, the likelihood of an elephant born in human care going back to the wild is, is not likely at all, but we are required to fully participate in species survival programs um, as a condition of AZA accreditation. So are elephants part of that? I mean, obviously the zoo has done remarkable species survival work, particularly with the California condor, which uh, could easily be extinct otherwise. Um, clearly the elephants are not going to survive based on any activities that we're doing, particularly with the lack of success that we've had over the years. So I, I presume the elephant part of that isn't realistic. Well, elephants are, are part of an SSP um, and fall under that same program that's administered by the AZA. But I would say that the population and future of elephants in human care are really um, something that uh, are being looked at by the experts that are managing both the Asian and, and African elephant populations in zoos, in accredited zoos. Now, since Billy's been so unsuccessful in breeding, could we not technically declare him surplus under AZA guidelines? Um, no, we don't declare him surplus. The SSP um, makes decisions about transfers and breeding of species under that particular SSP. And they would have to make the determination that Billy was surplus. We haven't asked them to consider that question, though, I presume. No, because we don't ask them to. I mean, they, they give us recommendations. They make the decisions based on the genetics and the population, and they have not determined or deemed him to be surplus to the population. Thank Beth, you. did you want to say something? Can I add something about um, animals going back to the wild, too? I think that right now there are no plans for any elephants born in zoos to go back to the wild, largely because there's not a lot of wild left to put them in, and it's overcrowded to be honest but there are species that a few years ago we thought would never be able to be reintroduced like gorillas or giant otters that are now on the verge of, of going back to the wild because of zoo born and zoo experience um, so i think that to say that elephants will never go back to the wild because of um, either being born in a zoo or because of the work of zoos is not accurate uh David, do you have a response to that specific question? I do. Um, I would love to share Ms. Schaefer's optimism, and I don't want to quell anything by suggesting otherwise, but there is only one alternative that's not going to kill the elephants, and that's a sanctuary. And uh, the only sanctuary, for example, that puts him into his own native habitat and has thousands of acres available would be Cambodian wildlife but all of them are much better places for them and will probably keep them alive uh, to their normal life expectancy to the extent they're not already limited by the suffering that they've already gone through. Uh, Ms. Volpert, I think you've had your hand up for a while. Uh, you're, you're muted still though. Um, I did, it was, it was largely to respond to the portion of an earlier conversation. Ms. Schaefer, nice to see you again. Uh, I recall that I took Ms. Schaefer's deposition in our lawsuit. And uh, relative to that, um, and, and the relationship between management and, and uh, keepers at the zoo that emerged from our lawsuit was that the management, by and large, doesn't seem to know what's going on. So it's easy for them to say they don't. Um, but one of the most uh, poignant moments in our suit was that before we actually brought it, we spent two years negotiating with the zoo to get Billy's records. And it was the most incredible example of, of an exercise of obfuscation that I've ever seen in my life. And I've been litigating for 45 years. Um, they did everything they could to, to hide these documents, to hide this information. And at one point, when they had produced about 1,700 pages, uh, they, they told us that that was everything. 
that they had given us everything relevant to release records, medical and otherwise. And a few weeks after we filed the lawsuit, they produced 20,000 documents. Oh my God. So um, this, this is a pattern of deception in which they have engaged. And as, as the court said, the Supreme Court, when commenting on the importance of the Public Records Act, when somebody engages in delay and refuses to be transparent, there's only one explanation. It's that they've got something to hide. Right. I would note that, that there, there's, uh, I don't believe any, any uh, documentation of any of that going on with current management at the zoo. Um, although uh, past practice obviously is problematic and we've fought that for uh, many years. But uh, in, in fairness to the current general manager, uh, I, I would uh, give them a little bit of a pass on that one. Uh, let me move on and ask a couple more questions and then uh, I think we're, we're probably ready to vote soon. Um, I'll throw this one out to anyone who wishes to respond to it. Uh, I know there was a Seattle Times investigation about a decade ago that found that most elephants who died in zoos died of chronic foot problems and musculoskeletal disorders, and that about half of them died by age 23. That's about a third of their natural lifespan. Uh, are any of you aware of this investigation or others like it, and what do you make of it? Dead on the money, well documented. Yeah. Um, we, we provided that. Um, there was a, a very lengthy um, article in the, um, I guess it was the Seattle Times uh, in yes. uh, 2012 that was a very lengthy and, and very impressive um, summary of, of that study and which they pointed out. It, it, the conclusion which is increasingly been reached by so many entities and I don't know why LA continues to fight it as the gentleman who was the head of Detroit said. Urban zoos are no place for elephants, period. That's all. And you know, I thought Mr. Morgan, uh, Morgan's, uh, Mr. Schwartz's uh, comments were so relevant and, and so important because a lot of people, you know, have said, well, isn't it wonderful uh, for children to be able to go and see elephants? Um, and of course, when you look back to the 19th century and the purpose of zoos was so that people could see things that otherwise they'd never see in their whole lives. But today, with film and video and the internet, we can all see every kind of elephant, every kind of animal in the world. We can see them in their natural habitat. We can see them acting the way they act if they're not being tortured. And boxing them up in little cages is no longer necessary for educational purposes, as uh, Mr. Schwartz pointed out so eloquently. So one of the sort of main uh, justifications for zoos really has ceased to exist. And, and like so many institutions, they become about protecting turf more than following their initial mission. So I, I think it's, it's very important to remember that this is not some uh, kind of crackpot uh, LA activity. The fact that elephants don't belong in zoos is now universally accepted by people who care about animals. So the time has come to let our animals live and there's no, there's no arguing with it anymore. Council Member Koretz, just in response to uh, the Seattle Times uh, article, um, uh, I'm not familiar with it, although I, I know in general just listening what it's about, but I, I just want to say um, in response to Ms. Wolpert and the reference to Mr. Schwartz's comments, um, again, we will just respectfully disagree because for everyone who might have an opinion that school children don't have an impactful uh, experience when they come to the zoo, I can give you 130,000 different reasons based on the school groups that come to the zoo, letters that we get, teachers that provide us feedback on the impact that the visit has. So again, it's opinion. 
And so for every opinion, we have one to counter that as well, because we hear back from people who use us as an educational resource and find value in the experience. Let me ask the last question for Sue's staff, and then I'm going to make some recommendations. Um, can I speak? So, can I speak? Can I speak? It's Cher. Yeah, sure. Okay. I, I don't know if this is true, but I it might be one of the only people who has taken an elephant, been there, seen an elephant with stereotypic behavior, and watched his unnatural movements and then taken him to Cambodia, and it was in the evening, and in the new enclosure, because he has to be through that to go to two other enclosures where he's, you know, free. But I saw him going through, through all of those motions, and, and the insane thing was, when we got to the big enclosure, I was in it, and all of a sudden, he slowly stopped doing it. He did it sometimes at at feeding time, he's 37. I believe that if these children knew the damage, they would not be appreciative. Their parents would not be appreciative. If they knew that you were ruining a, an elephant's life to have a display, I don't think they would be excited. And I think it's insane to call it an exhibit. To call, I mean, they said that about Lolita at the Seaquarium in, in Florida and they said it was educational, which it wasn't, and she's dying. So thank God I was able to save Kavon because I didn't save Billy. And 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 it's so inhumane. And they could give you all the statistics in the world. It doesn't matter. I have seen the results, and I know what I'm talking about. And I'm sorry that Miss Varick hasn't had enough time to study any of our any of our information but it doesn't make it less true thank you Cher. let me take two other comments and then i'll ask my last question morgan schwartz yeah i i just want to respond to miss verrett um when i was referring to the lack of educational value it wasn't in the entire i wasn't painting the entire zoo with one brush i was referring to the elephants and nothing else that was my point, that to have an, an animal out of its context um, is the problem, not to mention that, that you're teaching cruelty and inhumanity. Um, and you could actually reverse that and show people that you've got your act together and you're making changes because you have new information and make that space an enclosure in which people can actually visit in, in a dome and see the animals and listen to them and feel them in real time in Africa and in Asia. It's not about the other uh, elements of the zoo, which I, as I said earlier, I went to as a kid. I appreciate the condor repopulation, but it was only about the large animals that I'm talking about. Thank you for the clarification, Mr. Schwartz. Thank you. And, and Dorothy, would you like to give one last comment? No, thank you. If I could make one last comment, I was in uh, Moulton, Alabama uh, five years ago when a circus and ride elephant was confiscated in the small little remote town in northwestern Alabama. And we arrived with that animal at the Tennessee Elephant Sanctuary about three o'clock in the morning. And I slept in till about 11 and then I visited back to the Tennessee Elephant Sanctuary. And within 24 hours, Within 24 hours, that animal had completely changed, completely changed, completely changed. So um, I, I, my primary goal, and we've discussed a lot of philosophical things, but it all comes down to Billy and those three females and their health and what is best for them. They are the primary the primary reason we're here and for no other. Okay. Um, and the last question, uh, and I know we've, we've discussed this in passing. What do you think? I mean, we're, we're, we're talking about a compromise to begin with. 
I, I recognize that I don't think the council is ready to say, okay, we spent $42 million on this exhibit. Although uh, we told the council at the time it was a bad idea. Uh, they were turned somehow and, and decided to do it anyway. Um, I don't think the council's ready to shut down a $42 million exhibit or dramatically change it. So we're talking about a compromise. We're talking about uh, moving Billy to one of the sanctuaries that have offered to, uh, to cover the costs of his movement and care and let him leave the LA Zoo. Um, the question is, can we use this intelligently and enlarge the sanctuary I mean, enlarge the, the uh, exhibit space and make it a sanctuary for females in the LA Zoo. So we don't have to have the space divided. They get the full run of the area. Um, the zoos even consider exp considering expanding the exhibit, which if they don't add a bunch of elephants to uh, add to the space, um, would certainly be an improvement for them too. So in, in a not ideal, but uh, I would consider at least a significant step in the right direction. Um, what would you think of, of making use of the exhibit in that way, not trying to add a male elephant? I know people think, well, there's a little ex extra educational value to having male and female elephants. Uh, I think that is uh, uh, far outweighed by the, the cruel level of uh, putting them in a very small enclosure. What would you think of allowing us to make use of that larger enclosure and limiting the exhibit to female elephants? Again, I think that, that the zoo and its professionals need to be trusted to, to make whatever the appropriate animal management decisions are. And so limiting the number of elephants at our exhibit at any one time, the composition and how they use the space. Um, again, those are decisions that should rest with the zoo. Um, and so I'm just, that's what I believe and, and you should trust my leadership and, and, and um, our ability to do just that. Paul. Yes. So again, <clears throat> this is what the trial court said. The evidence at trial shows that life at the Los Angeles Zoo for Billy, Tina, and Jewel is empty, purposeless, boring, and occasionally painful. Their lives are supervised, managed, and controlled by zoo employees who appear to be in the dark about normal and abnormal behavior of elephants, in denial about the physical and emotional difficulties of the elephants they manage and whose lives they control and under the misconception that the elephants prefer to live their lives in an exhibit with human companions than with other elephants. The elephants are hardly, as defendants contend, thriving. I believe the right decision would be to move all of the elephants to a sanctuary, but if that is not possible, certainly should move Billy. Um, I just think it's that simple. They don't belong in small spaces on hard ground they don't live in zoos, they die in zoos. Could I say one thing? It's Sharon. Yes, and I think you'll be the last one and then I'll make a record. I don't understand why we should trust the zoo when they have proven themselves untrustworthy. I have not proven myself untrustworthy, Cher. Babe, you know what? It seems like you don't know very much about it since you just got there and you haven't read any of the information. And I, I would, I would say that since the zoo has an incredible track record of uh, mishandling elephants, uh, as and the court, I, I think was spot on in in their documentation of it. Um, I mean, I, I have hopes that you will do a better job, but uh, I don't think uh, we should let uh, Billy languish there any longer to find out. I think he is in. A bad mental and physical condition, and uh, we need to end what has been a very cruel period for for him at a minimum. Uh, with the female elephants, I think they've been they've probably been in worse situations than they are now. So, if nothing else, it was probably an improvement for them. Uh, I assume with 
no male elephant, uh, the zoo would expand the space where females are able to roam. Um, it would be certainly uh, much closer to a sanctuary environment, although still, uh, you know, quite a distance away. So uh, I would recommend that the committee would vote on the amended moving clauses that uh, that we have, and uh, uh, we we have them. Uh, uh, we have those votes separately. Um, if we could get Council Member uh, Harris Dawson back on the screen, um, and we could vote on these uh, items, unless you have any questions or comments, uh, Mr. Harris Dawson. Council Member Correct, I'm sorry, and I just wanted to, before Council Member Marquise Harris Dawson or Council Member Bonin uh, respond, I just wanted to correct what I said earlier um, and, and just clarify that as the first moving clause was stated, um, I had to ask to get it in writing because I heard it uh, differently um, than I actually read it. Um, I do not support that particular recommendation. Um, the recommendation that I would support is one that involves a report back to the city council on um, the steps um, that would be necessary to move Billy to a sanctuary and the implications of doing such. Um, and that would be an interminable delay for the last 20 years. We've been hearing things just like that. Yeah, you can put I, a time limit on such on a report back. You could put a time limit on it. Yeah, but the report will be against it, and they'd have to go through the same process again. No, and 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 the whole and, purpose and, of, and, and, the whole purpose of the report would be more delay and obfuscation. Well, it's, I think that the zoo has not. successfully, uh, up to this point, waited me out. And sure it's have. taken 13 years. We this is only before us because uh, this one and and uh, I'm not sure why was referred to uh, to this committee where we could actually hear it, which has never happened previously. But uh, if uh, if you're not in support of the first one, I might reword it. Um, that the city council instruct the LA Zoo to relocate. Billy the bull elephant to a suitable elephant sanctuary. So I will, I will read that now. Um, that the city council instruct the Los Angeles Zoo to relocate Billy the bull elephant to a suitable elephant sanctuary. So that's the first moving clause. Uh, Just for clarification, Councilman, that the, it would say that the council instruct the zoo which it has the power to do, to remove Billy from the zoo to a suitable sanctuary, pause or Tennessee, forthwith, no, no more studies. Well, there's no study involved in this wording. Um, if the zoo isn't in favor of it I, uh, as a compromise, then I think we just direct them to move him. Um, if we could have... Uh, uh, roll call on Mr. Harris Dawson. Are you still here? Okay, we're, let's have a vote on item number one. Okay, moving clause number one, Councilmember Coretz. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. And that item passes. Uh, item two, uh, recommendation two, that the city council adopt a policy that the Los Angeles Zoo shall not involve its bull elephant Billy in any breeding program involving the collection of sperm for use in artificial insemination or natural breeding procedures for the duration of his residence at the zoo without first, first consulting the Board of Zoo Commissioners and the City Council. We could have a roll call on that. Councilmember Koretz? Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. That item passes. Um, the third uh, moving clause is that the city council instruct the Los Angeles Zoo to report to the city council within 60 days on its existing animal welfare process, including any, any animal welfare working group they may have formed and who comprises it, how it functions, what steps it takes to ensure the well-being of the zoo's animals, and how it fits into the zoo's animal welfare framework. We could have a roll call on that. Councilmember Koretz? Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very 
We're good. That passes. Then number four, the fourth moving clause that the city council instruct the Los Angeles Zoo to report and provide documentation to the city council within 180 days on its program to improve the welfare of its elephant herd through making more extensive real-time use of the available acreage in the Elephants of Asia exhibit to the extent feasible, the prohibition of inhumane forms of dis discipline, uh, providing regular opportunities for exercise and enrichment and rototilling of, of the soil in the elephant exhibit to prevent it from potentially being in a compacted condition, which could be found to violate California Penal Code Section 5971 um, concerning exercising of confined animals. Okay. And I'm not sure if I'm reading my own notes correctly, if it's 5971 or 597T. 597T. Okay. Yeah, I thought I was, I thought I was misreading that. Okay. Right. To violate Penal Code Section 597T concerning exercise of confined animals. So we could have a roll call on that. Councilmember Koretz? Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. Aye. That passes as well. And so we are done with that item. Thank you, everyone, for your involvement and patience. Thank you. Thank you. Item number two. <laughs> item two CAO report relative to the September 2022 Human Resources and Payroll Project Quality Assurance Report from Gartner Inc. And I'd like to spend a, a few minutes discussing the HRP project. Uh, throughout my city council career, I have focused on working for equitable pay benefits and working conditions for city employees, um, which are, of course, the backbone of our public service, service infrastructure. And they make it all happen. And I've championed better technology for city workers for many years and the successful implementation of the Human Resources Project is the most important advance that we'll make for our employees in the foreseeable future. With just a few days remaining on my term on the council, I want to express my appreciation for everyone who's worked so hard on the HRP project over the last several years. No, and I'll work no. until my last day in office to help in any way I can to move the project forward towards a successful phase two launch. I'll also make myself available to meet with my successor as chair of this committee to provide continuity of oversight on this project, which touches every single employee. Uh, I first, I, I'd like to first ask Gartner to provide their presentation summarizing key issues at this point, as well as our expected timeline now for phase two, and then I'll have some related questions for you to answer. Member. I am Christine Wilson, Senior Director with Gartner Consulting. I am the Engagement Manager <clears throat> for the Gartner team that is providing quality assurance for the HRP project. Um, I can, um, ha I'm happy to summarize the key points from our September uh, QA report. I'll do that Please. quickly and then we, we're happy to take whatever questions you might have. Um, at the time of our report, there was some positive news on the project, and that was um, that some significant progress had been made on phase two integrations. So um, the, all of the, the tasks that were associated with developing those phase two integrations had been identified and included in the project plan. And um, that, of course, allows good visibility uh, into the status of the development and testing of those integrations and um, allows that good management of that, those activities through to their completion. So uh, integrations is a significant area of workload coming up for the project. So having that visibility uh, into its status is important. The other uh, key topic during that uh, September report was um, the, the level of staff density that would be required to achieve a uh, phase two go live in 2023. So Gartner team did uh, conduct an analysis of work, the workload that was ahead and the staffing that was in place at that time on the HRP project. 
and looking at those together, um, you know, to, in order to achieve a go live in 2023, most of the modules could do that, could achieve that go live in 2023 with some relatively minor uh, additions to staff density on the team. Rel relatively minor mean, meaning, you know, less than, on average, less than two FTEs per module um, to uh, being added to the team. There's one uh, outlier to that, and that is one exception to that, and that is payroll module. Payroll module required addition, uh, significant additional density to reach a 2023 go live date um, to the extent that it was unlikely at that time that that additional density would be achieved when it was needed. Um, we did recommend uh, in that report that the project explore a variety of strategies for increasing staff density. Um, it's, not a, it's not an easy, you can't just kind of add people into the mix and expect them to have the skills needed on day one to do this work. It does require, um, you know, experience in the, um, in the topic, right, and, and with city payroll. So uh, we, uh, again, recommended a variety of strategies be considered to increase density, um, better leverage the uh, SMEs that are currently on the project and look at a variety of ways to address this issue and help bring that, um, that uh, potential go live date for payroll in closer to a 2023 date. And uh, let's see, the last topic here uh, in summary of our September report is at that time there were uh, was effort going on to improve and formalize the project management processes for the project. That has something that, that's been something where the project has struggled, you know, in uh, during phase one. So uh, we were heartened to see that those efforts were going on to make a more uh, rigorous and more structured process for managing risks and issues, uh, a more rigorous process for managing the project plan and the tasks within that. Uh, and since that time, since the time of our report and uh, the September report publishing, there has been additional efforts to formalize these processes uh, by the, the project management team. So there has been progress there as well. So I know you've highlighted uh, uh, a few flaws in planning for a phase two go live, but uh, one that has me concerned is that the city, I believe, has yet to resolve interdepartmental differences of opinion about what city department will own payroll operations within Workday after phase two is implemented. From what I understand reading your report, and please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you believe it's the controller's responsibility, yet I've also been hearing that the current controller doesn't accept this conclusion and we'll, having, we'll have an incoming controller that really doesn't know anything about this process and we'll have a huge learning curve. So how, what, how do we determine that? Do we need the city attorney to provide clarity in order to plan this properly? Because somebody's gonna have to be formally in charge of, of this process going forward and, and once it's complete. So, uh, so based on based on our read of the um, city administrative code, uh, it, it clearly lays out payroll. The responsibility for payroll lies with the controller's office. Um, it, it doesn't seem that, that that's really the, the point of contention. Um, it, there seems to be a lack of clarity around responsibility for specific payroll activities, for some of those activities. Uh, historically, a contractor has been conducting the many of the more technical payroll activities for PACER. Uh, and going forward, this contractor will no longer be doing those activities once the new workday system is in place. So, um, and yet some of those activities and some new ones will need to be conducted in the workday world. So while the controller's office is responsible for payroll, um, it currently doesn't have the staff in place or specifically designated to take over those technical payroll operations. 
that will be needed in the workday world. Uh, so um, the kind of the issue that this raises now for the project is typically in a workday implementation, the team that will be running those payroll tasks once the system is implemented would be participating in testing as a way to conduct knowledge transfer, right? They get familiar with the system as they're testing, they're building their knowledge all along, that's preparing them to then take on those activities post go live. Um, so so that's, that's kind of the risk to the project is, is not having those, uh, those the, the team identified now so they can participate and also take on those tasks later. So we understand that um, there, there is discussions underway now with uh, the project management team. Um, they are planning to discuss directly with the controller's office to uh, look at different alternatives for creating that staffing, both to participate now in the project and longer term to be prepared to take on those technical aspects of payroll operations. Uh, so we, we do think that those uh, discussions will be happening very soon. And I don't know if there's anyone here from the controller's office that would like to also weigh in on this. Uh, yes, thank you, Council Member uh, Chris Concepcion, the Chief Deputy Controller, uh, and with me are uh, James Robinson, who oversees our payroll operations, as well as Janet Laszlo, who is our project manager for the controller's office. Uh, first, just want to thank you for being uh, an advocate for this project, for your engagement, uh, and ensuring, uh, you know, integrity of this project from the start. It's, uh, I know uh, that I can comfortably speak on behalf of the sponsor departments in that we appreciate uh, all of the attention you paid to this project. It's uh, been very um, helpful to all of us. Thank you. Um, I will say that I agree with what Christine uh, uh, mentioned. Um, you know, really uh, part of it is, uh, and this is something in addition to our discussions with, uh, with the CAO and the project management team, um, this is also an item that uh, Workday has flagged as an issue, uh, and they have offered to um, look into examining how uh, this process works for specifically around mass compensation changes, how this process works currently in the PACER environment, and how and looking at the workday environment and examining how it is that we can have a structure and we can have resources uh, implemented that match the workday environment. So they have offered to prepare an options paper for us. And I believe um, at our last steering committee meeting, uh, all the sponsor departments agreed to doing that. So this is something that's underway. Um, there is no uh, really resistance for um, offices to take on this work. We just need to make sure we know what that work is, what it involves, um, and what adjustments need to be made to, to resources in order to effectuate that. So, so how far along are we in this effort? Do we have a clear path or a roadmap to uh, resolving this issue? Um, in my view, I, I believe we do. Um, so the meetings, uh, we do have a meeting that's scheduled, um, I believe, uh, for uh, next week uh, with the CAO and with KPMG uh, and, and ITA, and I believe Gartner's involved as well. Uh, and so we plan to discuss the additional information that we know. Uh, and once the options paper is available from Workday, we plan to review that uh, and uh, request that that item come to steering committee so there's agreement on the item. Um, but that is something, you know, despite the transition that's happening, um, that is something that will be carried over uh, by uh, James Robinson, who's our principal deputy controller. Uh, that will be, uh, he's in a position that will uh, continue on uh, and will uh, continue to play an executive role on the steering uh, committee and with this project moving forward. Uh, and so that is something that um, is, is on his agenda. I've assigned that to him and he will uh, see that to fruition. Right, well, that's critical, obviously, for the controller's office to have continuity on this project. Otherwise, it would probably fall apart. Um, so that's okay. great. Um, for Gartner, one last question. Do you have any additional advice for city leadership to bring this project to a successful conclusion? 
Um, that's a, a great question. Um, we would say uh, focus on the payroll module. <laughs> Where, as payroll goes, the project goes. Um, and this is not to give uh, short shrift to any, to any of the other modules. Uh, it's just that the payroll module has the greatest workload and risk associated with it, um, both in terms of you know, successfully completing the project within the time frame and also being effective you know, uh, in, in its operation once go live is achieved. Um, so we would advise to give the payroll module the attention and the structure and the support it needs to, to create a way for it to successfully reach that target um, go live date in December 23 and you know, be, be set up in a good position to be fully successful upon go live. And certainly that's something I've had my eye on since this project started. That's where, that's where the danger is too and where some other cities and entities uh, have had this kind of a program blow up because they haven't done this, this particular area properly. So uh, I, I, I would echo that advice. Let's make sure that works. Uh, the rest of it, I think uh, we, we can handle and if there are problems, we can resolve them. But uh, we screw up our payroll, uh, we could be paying for it in, in both the employee morale and actual cost to the city. Um, one other question for the CAO. Um, ben, if you could please summarize the status of the Gartner contract and what role Gartner will be expect, expected to play in the next year leading up to phase two go live. Sure, um, and in fact, I think your, your following item is, is, uh, um, you know, is somewhat related, is, is completely related to, to that question. Uh, we are in the process of working on uh, amending our task order with Gardner to extend their services for another year uh, because uh, as, as you'll see in the, the next report, we, uh, this project is, is in fact going to be uh, taking up another year at least uh, for us to get to go live. So with that, our intent is to, uh, we've uh, already had, had discussion with the gardener and have, have uh, in essence put together the amended task order. Uh, all that is left will be for the uh, mayor to approve that task order um, and then for the funds to be approved uh, which is uh, incorporated within the, the next report you'll be hearing. Great. Well, uh, thank you everyone for all your involvement in this. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate everyone's good work to this point. And I'd like to recommend that we note and file the CAO and Gartner reports and thank everyone involved for your extended cooperation on getting us to phase two of this project. Council member, if I may just add one quick note. Sure. Uh, on behalf of the entire Gartner team, we'd just like to express our appreciation to you, Council member Kretz, for your strong support of the HRP project, um, for your service to District 5, and um, your dedication to the city of Los Angeles as a whole. We um, at Gartner, we appreciate your probing questions and keeping a focus on this project um, through this committee. Um, being independent and objective is one of those core tenets for Gartner. And so we've been very honored to have the opportunity to work with you in this committee um, as we all kind of collectively um, support the goals of the city to implement a new HR and payroll system. So thank you very much, council member. Thank you. And I appreciate all your great work as well. Thank you. We could have a roll call on this item. Very good. Councilmember Koretz? Aye. And Councilmember Harris Dawson? Yes. Very good. Item passes. Item number three. Item three Information Technology Oversight Committee report relative to authorizing the ITA to negotiate amendment number two to contract number C 135368 with Workday Inc. And before the committee today is the uh, Information Technology Oversight Committee report adopting several recommendations put forward by ITA relative to several different contracts for the further implementation of the HRP project. Um, I don't know if uh, 
uh, either the CAO or or ITA want to make any kind of opening comment or I have a few questions. Certainly, Mr. Chair, I could just provide a quick overview. Uh, as stated in the report, uh, and as was previously discussed, the HRP project went live with the phase one, the human resources module, uh, back in May of 2022. Since that time, city departments are now using Workday to onboard, to manage employees, to have digital employee records, position control, et cetera. Uh, the personnel controller, CAO, and ITA are supporting the phase one system. When it comes to the phase two component that was being discussed, Per workday, as stated in the report, we're looking at about an 80% completion, especially at the point of time the report was written, for six out of the seven phase two modules. And as was described by Gartner, the key really is the payroll module. Um, what we really require for the upcoming phase two effort is the testing, the training, and the launch. So a lot of configuration across key areas has been completed. There needs to be that confirmation, those testing phases, the training phases, and the launch phases. Um, the go live date, uh, as was worked through from various departments, it's a, I, I don't want to, you know, duplicate a lot of what was said on the last item. Uh, I think that really does a good job of describing some of the, you know, the key issues uh, and what's being worked on to try to work through those items. Uh, we agree with everything that was stated in regards to the importance of payroll, the importance of dotting our I's and crossing our T's and delivering really an effective solution. Um, there certainly are significant uh, there are issues that continue to uh, raise challenges for the project, and honestly, every project they've been on has issues, and the effectiveness of the teams and the departments working together to resolve those issues tends to really represent the success of the project. A lot of issues have been resolved through this project, and many others continue to need to be resolved as we work toward December 2023. I think it's also worth mentioning, though, a lot of the issues and risks that come from a delay. Uh, we initiated this project due to the precarious situation of the existing payroll system PACER. Um, we deal with it because the current split payroll process with Workday and PACER is really unsustainable. Uh, people are receiving their paychecks, but really it's due to heroic labor intensive and error prone efforts being done by controller's office, IT and others. We know the MOU, MOU negotiations are very difficult to implement in PACER. The longer we're on the payroll, or PACER process and the spit payroll process, the more issues that we have with this. We know multiple city departments are in the process of changing peripheral systems, and that requires rework in HRP. Um, so, you know, we can list a lengthy list of reasons as to why, and we all know why it's extremely important to get off PACER, to get effectively onto work day, but of course to do so in such a way where it doesn't harm employees who are readily reliant on it. Um, I'm not sure if CAO had any additional items to provide for an overview, but I believe the report does try to state a lot of the key items related to this topic. Yeah, uh, the, the only thing I would add is, is the fiscal impact because it, it is a significant fiscal impact that uh, we actually alerted council through our financial status report of this potential impact, and that's about a $30 million increase to to the whole entire um, you know the, the various contracts involved with this implementation so we have uh, contracts that need to be extended with uh, workday and Accenture who are the the leads in terms of implementing the, the new system we have contract extensions as I mentioned with uh, the QA Gartner uh, to continue their the quality assurance over the project for the term um, uh, until go live uh, we have um, uh, pro, uh, co contracts that need to be executed with uh, KPMG, who is now uh, helping us with project management. And then we also have uh, uh, several, um, uh, you know, needs with regard to uh, the existing PACER system, because as, as we continue to work on phase two, we continue to have uh, PACER um, with us with respect to, to um, uh, you know, paycheck delivery and everything associated with that. And so there, there's a need for for um, hardware and other items and, and extensions with the HES, HES and Associates as well. So uh, it's a big team that's involved with, with this project, with keeping PACER up and running and with uh, bringing on the new system um, concurrent to that. And what do we think of the, uh, the December 23 go live date? Um, any chance it winds up uh, being able to go live earlier? Uh, what are the chances that it takes longer and we go live in 2024 somewhere? 
you know, I, I'm not sure if earlier would, would be possible. I think there's there's actually some advantages of it going um, on that date of December because of the, the, the separation of the tax years. Um, having one one tax year completely on pay services, having to have a tax year kind of uh, on on pay sir and workday would be a, a, uh, adding some difficulty. So so I think ideally we are looking at December. You know, the, not 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 to say that there isn't that that risk of it falling behind, but but um, you know this team is working hard and and uh, taking direction from Mark QA. Focusing on payroll will be the, the you know I think critical component to our success. So you think we can we can hit the December deadline at least? For the I think it's going to be. I think the other, um, all the other modules, with the exception of payroll, have a very good chance of of being ready. You know, well before that December, and it's going to be up up to um, on payroll, the payroll module for it to to really, um, you know, get the resources it needs to 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 reach that date. And so it, it will be a challenge. Um, don't want to uh, you know understate that. And. Uh, uh, I'll trust that everyone will push to uh, have this included in uh, the next year's budget with adequate funding and staffing so uh, we can do it right and not miss the date. Um, let's see. How do we, what, what do we need to do to make sure PACER continues to function for another year because my my sense has been it's kind of hangs by a thread um dependent on the well-being of the consultant etc cetera, etc cetera. uh do we, is there any danger that this doesn't make it through um you know how are we looking at that yeah mr chair ted ross with ita you raise actually a really good point um, I remember that I believe it was KPMG was requested by the controller's office to do an assessment regarding PACER. They had a lengthy 100 plus page report describing all sorts of critical issues. That report was published over five years ago, right? Uh, and yes, it is hanging on by a thread in a lot of critical ways. First of all, there's issues related to the hardware. Um, the hardware itself, the applications running on legacy hardware that you can't go out and buy anymore. Secondly is the software. There's coding and aspects of the code that need to constantly be revised. There's cybersecurity issues uh, that we've already been applying additional layers of security on top of. Uh, there's issues that come down to the contractor themselves. One of the key reasons why it was important to replace such a highly customized system with an off-the-shelf system was the ability for sustainability and maintenance, the ability to hire one of hundreds of, or thousands of Workday consultants who can help support the Workday system, as opposed to a highly customized system effectively written by one person with some support from, from several others. Uh, an organization the size of the city of Los Angeles, it's incomprehensible when we talk to other colleagues to have such a highly customized and specific system that really does rely on such of those key items. Uh, and unfortunately, as we're now in the split payroll process, when we really intended to have the system fully replaced, it actually has even made it more difficult. So, you know, we're fully committed in the sense of needing to replace the PACER system. And yes, every pay period challenges do come up and the ability of the PACER system to continue. And I'm not, I'm not an alarmist, but the ability of the PACER system to continue has been highly, highly, it's, it's extremely high risk. Um, and so as every month that we continue on the PACER system, we do run the risks of significant payroll issues. And if the system collapsed, could we accelerate the conversion to a workday and desperation? How, how would we deal with it if we did have that happen? I believe the way the project needs to be run, and I know Workday has you know opinions in this in this very matter. The way the Workday project needs to be run is you know we need to run on two tracks, and one track is to take the kind of the methodical uh, a step by step approach that has actually been you know maybe some of the cause of the delays up to date to ensure that the city dots its I's and crosses its T's, but also have kind of a rapid aggressive approach in our back pocket. Because if we truly do have a failure in the PACER system and an inability to continue to run payroll, then we have to have a quick ability to leap over and to start running. It would mean that we'd have 
a lack of, I think, testing in some key areas, which is not how you want to implement a system like this. But what we're describing is not a plan A or a plan B, but a plan C, you know, an emergency approach in which we could leverage Workday, uh, the configuration that's already been made and the ability for us to process a payroll. Uh, the longer this project goes, the more these types of risks start to raise their head. And it just reemphasizes the importance of implementing and fully implementing Workday. I think that's absolutely true, and I think it's good to hear that we have a plan C in the unlikely but existent possibility that this system that uh, needed to go a long time ago uh, is is not completed in time. So uh, I appreciate that. Um, and I think that's probably everything I really need to ask. So I am confident that this project is in good hands. I, I wish you well with it. Uh, hopefully we, we now have a good plan and uh, we also have a plan to accelerate if we need to take the chance in the worst circumstances. So I thank everybody for their good work. And uh, uh, I've asked for a vote on the recommendation, which is to approve the recommendations indicated in the ITA report dated October 31st, 2022, and as approved by the Information Technology Oversight Committee. If we could have a roll call. Oh yes, Councilmember Koretz. Aye. Councilmember Harris Dawson. Yes. Very good. That item passes. Uh, is there anything else on the desk? That clears the desk. Well, thank you, everybody. It has been a wonderful experience. We may or may not have one more meeting. If not, uh, uh, thank you for the pleasure of working with all of you. Very good. And we are adjourned.